So there's a command in the New Testament to gather and to meet. Why, why, why isn't you and I at Starbucks, the church? The cultural norm for the church for the last 2,000 years has been to be in person, you know, this specific way. This thing that we're doing has a real life social influence on people. Simply because something is innovative right. Right, and brand new doesn't mean it's not good. I'm going to quote guys like Luther and Calvin, J.I. Packer on this. And um, <laughs> no, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Coming at you live from our studio here on Kingdom Thinking. Welcome. I'm Hansel. This is Josh, my co-host. And we got a really interesting topic today for you guys. So, Josh, do you remember, I don't know, six months ago in the thick of the pandemic when we talked about uh, churches shutting down and the necessity for in-person church services. Yep. So we talked about the different physical, mental, and emotional reasons why it would be so important uh, for people to be able to have access to of their course. worship services and things like that. And we kind of talked about those nuances and the discretions that people need to take. Well, now I want to ask the converse question, which is, now wait a minute, the pandemic, at least hopefully, right, kind of knock on wood, fingers crossed, uh, is on its tail end, hopefully. Mm -hmm. As of June 15th, California has opened up a little more. Uh, masks are a little discretionary now, yep. right? Uh, churches are starting to get full in-person services. I want to ask this question. What about Zoom church? Is there something sure. to that? C like, Can we do Zoom church long-term? Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Or is this a nope, period, stop, we must go back to in-person services? Let's talk about this. What do you think? Give me some initial reactions. Yeah, so from personal experience here, we saw tremendous growth in our digital platforms over COVID. So we started okay. going uh, live online. We started that whole world probably 2015, 2014, right? So we were a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of being ready to make the jump online. Mm. Now, obviously, we had to like do major changes and stuff just like everybody else did. Uh, but for us what we were able to see on Zoom would be uh, an amazing response in terms of really? our small group attendance, right? Those things hmm. blew up. We had several hundred people, right, in our church community jump in because everybody could all of a sudden get on. Because yeah. one, one of the things that I think people don't often or kind of forget to associate when they're talking about online church stuff is like the unique role that the pandemic played in that it just homebound everyone or right. made everyone Just homebound forced right you it, to do it. so you had nowhere to go there and, and that was a bit unique right yeah. and that will not be the same thing moving forward so Correct. i think it would be a little bit foolish to expect uh the online world to yeah. be as pervasive or as right. well attended right. let's say as it was during the pandemic particularly when everybody's trying to get out yes now yes um so you value more of the in-person stuff but regardless i still think this is kind of interesting to me because the convenience correct of doing everything online correct has been incredible now yeah. i was fortunate enough i already work remote mm -hmm. so my job didn't change i was still able to you know golf and bike ride and all those things that i picked up i was very fortunate during mm -hmm. that time i know a lot of people were not so i don't want to take that flippantly right but the convenience that i experienced throughout that time was amazing yeah and so like i'm not being cynical about this but i really I want to talk about this from like an ethical, theological, and then just social perspective. Like, is it tenable to do Zoom church yeah. from a social, moral, or theological perspective? So here's what I want to do. I want to do a pro and con first from a theological perspective, sure. from like what is church supposed to accomplish in principle? And then I want to do a pro and con for Zoom church from a more social experiential perspective. So here's what I got. The theological case for in-person versus remote mm -hmm. long-term church mm -hmm, attendance. Mm -hmm. Here's how someone would make a case from a, a theological perspective that in-person should be the prescriptive model yeah. for church. You might cite uh, biblical passages, right? That's that's probably a good place to start. Yep, usually. Uh, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 is a, is a really good passage. Is that passage. the let us not give up? the habit of meeting together it is yeah, yeah okay. it's that one it's uh -huh. that really long like uh verse and if i paraphrase paraphrased it it would be something like do not be like these other people yeah do not stop attendance do not stop the gathering yeah, yeah. the the ecclesia the which just it's a, just a fancy word in in greek for the gathering those mm -hmm. who have been called out 
um, as many have, but rather persist in in the gathering, right? So, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's some imperative verbs yeah. in there, which are it just means it's a command. Yeah, command verbs. Um, so there's a command in the New Testament to gather and to meet. Now, granted, right? There's context in the letter and debate on interpretation of wait a minute, but is this actually a specific command, meaning uh, time and place, or is right. it a transcultural, universal kind of command? Uh, but that's a good place to start Certainly. to make a case. Secondly, I, and I want to spend a little more time on this. I think if we had a little deeper discussion on what the nature of the church is, yeah. then uh, the case for pro uh, Zoom church or not could be fleshed out a little more. So cards on the table. I'm a Protestant. I'm uh, I'm a, a Calvinist. I'm uh, from the Reformed tradition. Over right? three. So I'm going to quote guys like Luther and Calvin, J.I. Packer on this. And um, <laughs> no, I'm here. I'm here. Luther says that here's, here's what the church is, guys. The church is where the word of God is faithfully proclaimed and the sacraments are practiced and there's church discipline. Now, this could, would be like your bare bones, Protestant or evangelical nature of the church where the Word of God is preached, and there's the sacraments, and there's church discipline. Now, what what would we define as the sacraments there? So, for a Protestant, the sacraments are the Lord's Supper mm -hmm. and baptism. Mm -hmm. If you're from Eastern tradition or Catholic tradition, then there's more, right? right. Like marriage, church, uh, confirmation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Uh, so, this is what distinguishes you and I hanging out at the golf course, talking about the Bible, and saying like, dude, we're doing church. Because we're talking about the Bible. Right. And Matthew 18 says that where two or more are gathered in my name, this is where I'll be, right? So, like, this kind if of— If that's true, he'd help my golf game more than he right? does. <laughs> so, this is my my very sarcastic approach to kind of me and my Bible Lone Ranger approach. Let's yeah. meet at Starbucks. I don't want to go to a building kind of thing, right? right? Now, what differentiates that, why, why, why isn't you and I at Starbucks, the church? Well, because— there's no church discipline there because we're not accountable to a body, to a group. Um, and so I, I do think this is significant that the in-person components of uh, administering the sacraments like the Lord's Supper, mm -hmm. communion, and baptism, uh, the in-person components of, of church discipline, there's a real in-person accountability that there's, I don't know if this is the right way to say it, but there's a real kind of shame and disgrace that leads to restoration that right. is part of the body of like a, a wound and healing yeah, process. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, that these aren't just administrative categories. This is a theological basis that says, no, 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 that's not just how the church operates. That's what the church is. is. Yeah, right, right. That's how you would make a case for that. Um, lastly, Acts chapter four, this is a really trippy passage and it's been very impactful for me ever since like the first time I read it. There's at the beginning of the book of Acts, um, when Jesus leaves in the ascension and he, the spirit comes down after Pentecost and the apostles are like, all right, well, I guess it's game on. Um, the government and the, the religious authorities as well as the political authorities don't like it. Mm -hmm. And so in Acts 4, there's a specific encounter with the religious authorities where they say, you need to stop. Right. Stop preaching this Jesus. Stop. Basically, stop wreaking havoc for this underground religious group. Stop. Like you're officially getting a government uh, kind of threat ultimatum now. And the response of the apostles is, far be it from us right. to obey men rather than God. Meaning, this thing that we're doing has a real-life social influence on people. And by vehicle or by means of holding on to this conviction, e in light of a government threat, that's actually the vehicle that the Spirit uses mm -hmm. for conversion, mm -hmm. for growth. Now, I, I'm not saying that's the one principle that all Christians should sure. take every, like, you know, fist in the air to the government. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the narrative of Acts, the way that it was written, specifically seems to me to point how subversive socially this is. Right. That doesn't happen online. Correct. I think that's how you would make a case for that. Can you think of anything else? No, I think, I think it is really lost or won in the nature of the church, right? The second point that you brought up. Yeah. If you are going to 
Uh, I've said this before, right? The only thing you can't do is be with someone by yourself, right? You can't be in community alone Mm -hmm. there. And as kind of simple or trite as that is, I think the power of the spirit working in community and through the community is unique in the way that the church is designed to function, particularly as the bride of Christ, right? And so to me, the the second point is probably, yeah. Okay, so then to make a case for, uh, now wait a minute, there not only are there cases where it would be acceptable to meet remotely, but here's how we can. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so we have uh, certain things, right, that are uh, the first stuff that pops up into your mind. Physical limitations like illness, there's transportation issues, there's impairment stuff that people run into all the time, right? Yeah. One thing I used to do when Somebody's I was in high school. Written. Yeah, when I was in high school, I was a uh, part of this team where we would take communion to people who were oh, stuck in their home. That's interesting. Right, and they couldn't, like they physically couldn't right, get out of bed. Right, they Yeah, and so we would administer communion with them. We'd pray over them. We'd sit and we'd do some scripture reading with you them. You said when you were in high school? Yeah. Was this the, like with your pastoral leadership? And just stuff? one of the leaders in our church, one of our like uh, high school guy leaders, we would just go because it was like, hey, there's a huge need here. Yeah. Nobody wants to do this, right? And this is part of like that's interesting. ministering to widows and orphans. Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. Mainly widows at that point. But uh, so that was very powerful. It was a very powerful experience. Uh, and so now, because we have this ability people can kind of zoom in or they can watch on facebook live or watch on you know whatever network that people want to be a part of they can hop in the chat and they can type and they can be a part of things and it can be this transformative experience it, it with people still be online. Interactive. yeah uh and so uh yeah this is a very interesting kind of conversation yeah. because it breaks yeah, it down is. into what counts as a specific limitation right versus a personal preference exactly right and that's a you know, that's a way some people like I know students. Here's a good example. Right. This is big in student ministry right now. There are people who have killer online programs for student ministry, have kids joining them from like out here in SoCal, have kids joining them as far away as Sweden who say, this is my home. This is my home. My church. home. This church? church in Riverside, California. Dude, that's crazy. I'm from Sweden. This is my this is this is my community. This is my as small opposed group. to like a church in their a local church, for yeah, them. in their community. I've never yeah. thought about that. And it's gnarly. They have life transformation. They receive Christ there. Like somebody baptizes them in their community as a. Like, well, on yeah, behalf how would they of, get baptized? Yeah, they have a believer from their community baptize them, and they on like, behalf of a church like across. This. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and so it's like they're experiencing real life change, and part of the reason they don't go out and find a local community is because they have such crippling social anxiety, for example. That's right. Interesting. And so, at what point we have to ask that question? Right. Does personal preference? fall into a category of limitation for somebody yeah. who might opt into Zoom church over and again, somebody who physically, you know, can't, those ones feel obvious to me, right? Right. You're bedridden, you can't do anything there, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What isn't so obvious is something like social anxiety, yeah. right? And so um, I don't feel equipped correct, to be correct. An, an arbiter or a judge no. of like, no, you need to get out of here, yeah, like yeah. suck it up. Not with a 10 foot pole, man. I'm not, not no. going anywhere near that one. But, but I think it's interesting. Yeah. Because I, I would say something like, um, and, to be more specific than social anxiety, maybe uh, mental health barriers where somebody might not feel comfortable mm-hmm. or or even able yeah, to yeah. be part of a local community. Maybe there's, I don't know, there could be a variety of reasons, right? Either with trauma, abuse, or, or, or anything else, yeah. or a family context where it would not be possible for yep. them just mentally or emotionally to be part of that. But they happen to be having real relationships, real transformation, yep. and real communion online. Yep. That is, I had never thought about that. Right. Um, and I, I know there's like probably PhDs out there with like, how does transformation happen in online community? Sure. That would be kind of a really interesting yeah, read it'd be on good. this. So, so how do we delineate a like spiritual or moral uh, value on something like that? Yeah. Like, I, is that still true to the nature of the church? Well, when I anticipate what was so fascinating about the first century church was their ability to kind of break barriers and molds Mm. expectations and more specifically cultural norms right correct and the cultural norm for the church for the last 2000 years has been to be in person you know this specific way done with some variation of sacrament yeah in a specific place yeah and then particularly evangelicalism right like 10 a.m sunday morning that kind of thing there and so to me, this just is another way that the church can innovate and break the mold that is there because rude. these, you know, from the story that I'm thinking of specifically that I just told you, it's the like this girl is, yeah, this girl is checking in with her small group. Every That's week. a real story, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not making that up. That's okay. a real thing that I know about. Uh, and 
So she's checking with her small so group leader. Yeah, dude, she's got a community that's holding her, that's like helping her grow spiritually. She's practicing spiritual <laughs> disciplines. And it's like, and she's just one of dozens and dozens of yeah. stories from I know who I know of from this guy who's like leading this amazing online youth ministry out here. And they hired a full time like online, online youth pastor. Dude. And it's his whole job <laughs> to facilitate and grow these communities. And it's online like online youth pastor. Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. And so, uh, it's nuts, man. I mean, that it's is... truly a, an amazing thing. And so to me, simply because something is innovative right. right, and brand new doesn't mean it's not good or it doesn't mean it doesn't have the same merit in those types of ways. N- nor does it mean that it is good. Correct. And so it's it's a neutral thing that we have to do kind of a longitudinal assessment of okay. the, in, okay. before we can call it one way or the other. Okay. Now, I will say, I think any person with half a brain would recognize that there are strict limitations on this for this gal right in sweden who's going to get older who's going to be you know 18 19 20 21 and not have that same community people are going to drift apart because if we drift apart in life from friendships relationships whatever how much more so so. will we do it online correct and so that is a thing so there are limitations yeah and so part of that would be i think the way that we would supplement that or continue to make this case for a good zoom church would be to say how do you build successful off ramps in the communities that you are Mm. established that allows people to plug into local bodies okay. as they grow and as they mature. That would be something I'd be really interested yeah. in. Because at face value, I'm just going to be honest, I'm not buying it. Sure. Um, however, if the conversation becomes, how could this be in like a, an ignition switch? Correct. Into something where the localized church, the localized gathering can still be the ideal? Yeah. I mean, that's something I might be able to. Well, and especially if you just on. use the online Zoom world as like a stomping ground or a testing ground to show people that church doesn't have to be weird, Christians don't have to be creepy or mm. bigoted or whatever, right? Like whatever thing we, <laughs> right, right, whatever right. baggage we bring. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, and then it's like, okay, I found a good church here, so that means other good churches have to mm. exist. And so, to me, to position yourself well as an online pastor, it has to come with the idea of like building those intentional off ramps that trains people that's, to that's leave your Zoom room and get into, right. you know. That's fascinating. So it's not the end all be all, right? It's it's a vehicle. Yeah. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Yeah. So the second thought in this one is uh persecution and the need for underground churches, right? Yeah. The question we have to ask are like, must Christians always expose themselves to risk of jail, death, whatever that or kind true. of thing is? Yeah, or are they allowed to meet safely? Yeah. There and Zoom certainly would be an option. Yeah, has now, obviously an ability not in to the do US. That. Right. But there right. are a lot of parts in the world where that's a real life yeah. consideration. Um and you just think about the Apostle Paul. All right. Um, sometimes he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm for Christ and go ahead. Like, um, uh, what's what's the word? When they give him the 39 lashes. Uh, Flogged. Yes. Yep. And then the other time he's like, no, 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 I'm a Roman citizen. Yeah. Back up. Or sneak me out in a basket. Right. right. <laughs> exactly. And so um, unfairly or fairly, we can take that to mean that you don't have to walk into a beating Correct. all the time. So would it be ethical and still true to the nature of the church for Christians who are in dire circumstances say, all right, guys, like we're going to have to meet online. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting question. Mm-hmm. Are, are they denaturing the church right. somehow? Like, you know what I mean? I would be hard pressed to say yes. Yeah. Um, you know, as I sit in my, you know, Southern Super California yeah. studio. Yeah. Uh, as well, we so like I know this. of small groups that would meet on things like WhatsApp, right? Oh. And so they would jump into these like private, right, cause, secure cause connections. Because WhatsApp isn't- It's encrypted. It, it's not- uh, government regulated, yeah, so you can't, right? you can't trace it, right? right. And, and so the encryption allows them to meet secretly yeah. and have these conversations, right? And you can jump in and you can have a full Bible study it's, through yeah. something like that tool, Dude, right? That's and that's nuts. a pretty powerful right. you know, way to experience the yeah. Holy Spirit that way. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, so the question we're asking here is, can the Spirit's witness and power of the transforming gospel still be effective through something like Zoom or WhatsApp? Um, we're, you, we're used to inviting people to church. Could you imagine, hey, here's the Zoom link. Uh, yeah, dude, I lived it for the last year. <laughs> there. I can't imagine, you, right? You. Like, like, I mean, I think the most transformative experience for myself in this was over the last year, right? I had about 20 to 25 leaders that I was kind of overseeing, right? In terms of like connecting with from our junior high and our high school side and all of that stuff. Yeah. And the amount of uh, deep depression that mm. a lot of my adult leaders fell into, uh, the amount of conversations that we had about suicidal ideation, people feeling like they couldn't do it anymore. And the Zoom Monday night, 6.30 to 7.30, was like the thing mm. that was keeping people holding on. Or in the, mm. the phone call that was coming later in that week, right? And, yeah. You know, I had people tell me that that yeah. was the life definer for them over that period of time. And so it's like, 
here's the Zoom link just became a normal part of our vocabulary. It didn't, yeah. it didn't even feel weird, you know, by point. like August of last year. Right. There, because we were just so used to like, this is how we see people now. And yeah. this is how we see, and this is how we do life. Everybody's in this weird and little box. Crazy. There. And, and it was massively real yeah. to us. And I don't think we're going to know for at least another 15 years. Right the consequences of that. Yeah, certainly. Socially, at least long-term, right? However, uh, necessity warranted it. And if we're going to say that, oh, there's too many limitations for that, mm -hmm. we also have to say it's it has a, a place to be adequate and yeah, real course. and meaningful yeah, for a lot of people. Deeply meaningful. So, man, I, I feel torn about it now. Yeah. I thought this was, oh, easy, T-ball. No, you have to go in person or you're failing. And it's yeah. like, ah, I don't know anymore. Yeah. Um, so that's the theo that's how you would make a case theologically. Mm -hmm. What about just existentially or from an in-person experience of pro uh, Zoom church, con, or no Zoom church? In person, um, the case for in-person versus remote is people need people. Certainly. I think the pandemic has taught us that. Uh, I, I was listening to my, my wife uh, talk to one of her colleagues and she's like, you know what? Like social distancing is such an unfortunate term right? because it suggests that you're completely detaching from other people. And that's like, that's not healthy. Right. So physical distancing, like, yeah, but not, hopefully not emotional and, yeah. and mental and yeah. spiritual distancing yeah. 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 from yeah. people. Right. And the experiences of, of so much, so much mental health burdens on, on people has been real, you're incredible. Right. right. And so people need people isn't just this uh, saying, right? Like we can point to empirical science. Yeah, of course. Uh, oxytocin, yep, yep. chemicals in our brains that wire us to need a hug or, or just look somebody in the eyes and know I'm listening, that kind of thing. And so I don't think it's hard to make a scientific case right. that in-person church is going to lead to healthier families, healthier kids, and we should not abandon that. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, is should we demand it right. as the only thing, as the exclusive uh, form of church? Um, here, here's here's an interesting thing. We, I'm good with meeting online or in person with the people I like. It's something I look forward to. Mm -hmm. What about the people I don't like? Sure. Meeting in person demands or assumes that I'm going to be sharing a worship space with that annoying person. Mm -hmm. And that that's a good thing. Yeah. There's something formative and transformative and growing about loving those people you don't like. Mm -hmm. Um and under like a, a group confession, like if, if in your church you do a group confession, there, there's things you can't replicate. Yes. Uh, the second thing, which I think is less important but still meaningful, is administrative efficiency. Uh, how do you administer baptism and communion online? That's that's the most glaring limitation. Yeah, uh, yeah baptism certainly, but communion do. You let people know a week, I mean, we did this, right? You let people know a week ahead of time. Hey, we're doing communion. Get we're your, all taking it together next week. Get your crackers ready yep. kind of thing. Get your cracker oh, and your juice. Man. Or your Sprite and your waffle, whatever you, I mean. Oh, you know, my God. Whatever you Stop. Got. Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> there, yeah. It's certainly easier. Stop it. And more meaningful in person. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you can do it online. Then it's like, well, I, I did. I took I'm, communion I'm with my family. And... I'm going to move on. <laughs> I'm going to move on. Uh, how about this? This is something we haven't thought of. In, if you're, like, from a big church, you probably have hundreds of employees. What about those people's jobs? Mm -hmm. I I would hope that's part of the ethics of our conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the science or the studies on like, are people tend to give more if they're in person or online? I don't know. But if churches are down, people are losing jobs. Mm -hmm. If if this hybrid model is adopted as a go-to, my guess is there's going to be less staff needed. Yeah. Uh, I think that should be a consideration at well, least. Well, it, it kind of cuts both ways, right? So the data on churches shows that uh, most churches are actually doing pretty well fiscally coming really? out of COVID. Yeah. And I think part of that is because the online push to giving happened several years ago. And so it's since been 2010, 2011, there was a real big push by a company called Push Pay uh, that helped kind of move a lot of churches, small, medium, and large to this online platform. Like put your card on file kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. And you can automate your tithe to make it come no out way. in two weeks, right? And Dude. so it becomes a little bit like your light bill at that point, which can be, you know, <laughs> a little problematic. Okay. Uh, but 
you know, it's uh, push pay always had this thing where it's like your giving would go up like by 5% every year or something like that. Yeah. I mean, because they had seen it work so many times because people could automate it, you know, and it became right. one less thing they had to think consciously about. So it may, about. may be a little easier to commit to mm-hmm. it if it's not every week. Oh, I got to make the decision right. every single right, Sunday. Right, right, right. Okay. All right. What would be uh, a support for remote from a social perspective? Uh, I think the time commitment is nicer. Okay. There, right. So you don't have to get ready. Yeah. Drive. Put the sit kids in, traffic, in the car. Right. It it allows look you look your to, Sunday best. Yeah. Yeah. It allows you to just dude. Everybody's like sweatpants and a shirt. They're like solid. They're right. Yeah. You're wearing that same hat for the ninth day in a row. Like dude. Nobody's getting mad at you. Nobody can tell if you brush your teeth or not yet. Right. Like those things mm. create which are barriers. Yeah. Right? That's what I'm saying. You're. That's what I mean. You're removing barriers of entry for people to move into these that's, social. That's communities. another thing I hadn't thought of. Mm-hmm. I I've probably the most nervous I've been about my attire has been on Sundays. For mm-hmm. church, yeah, probably. of course. Um, the kids. Yeah. If you have, if you have small children, yeah, dude, that's, somebody that's with a, a small mission, child, it's hard, right? Uh, yeah. Dude, that's so interesting. So removing that, right. Uh, probably is going to make somebody more likely to get up at 10 AM for a service. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. What else? Uh, you're also able to put things on demand. Right. So what do you mean? People can. So an example would be when you record a church service. Right. And you premiere it to Facebook. It comes out at a certain time. Right. Like, let's say Saturday at 530. Right. 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 But if you're having dinner, you got kids, something's going on. You can't watch at that time. You can still gather the family down at seven and you can watch it then Hmm. together. Right. So it doesn't demand a live attendance for you in order to have some type of spiritual experience. Okay. There you're able to do that at convenient times for you. Um. That's obviously different than everybody logged in at the same time. Correct. Do you think that takes away from the corporate connection? Yeah, I mean, invariably it does, There, but it allows you to have a connection with your family unit, right? And so depending on how you want to play it, right, sometimes you're not going to be able to make it the same way. So it allows you to still be able to maintain something, even if it's 20%, 30% of the value of the community okay. experience. The on-demand portion allows you to still be able to gotcha. have a small gotcha. Gotcha. glimpse into that So world. I think my question would be, and I don't have the answer to this, you said even if it's 20 to 30% of what it would be like, okay, what percentage is adequate or satisfactory? More than 20 or 30%. Hopefully, right? Oh, yeah, but, it has to be. But I think that's that's I think that's the question we're asking, yeah. right? What percentage or what, um, yeah, what level of proximity to the real life experience is satisfactory mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i i don't want to just be a relativist about it and right. just be like well just pick what's good enough for you right right but i also don't want to be dogmatic about it well the data doesn't bear out relativism either though across any generational polling right so uh barna released a set of stats recently that showed even 67 percent of millennials want a hybrid in-person option, right? Oh. And obviously Zoomers, their opinions aren't really relative yet because they're still, most of them are still super young in terms yeah. of being under 18. Yeah. They're, and so they're going to kind of go with the flow. But it's like that number, that in-person desire number only grew for Gen Xers and Boomers and then you know, the silent generation or whatever. And, and so if 67% want an online or in-person option, yeah. they're like that high of a number that shows that the They're data not just is quitting on in person. Yeah, the data is pretty solid on this. Okay. That like humans generally understand that the human to human connection will always and forever win out and be better than just the online okay. thing until we're fully AI and we're just living in like that Ready Player One world, yeah. which or then the, will be dope. The iRobot. Yeah, yeah, which would be sick. No, no. I mean, not. mine is like the death of every right. all of humanity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, in in all fairness, right, the people who don't want to commit to your group, aren't going to do it no matter what. Right. And so we're talking about the few, maybe the middle group that are saying, if you remove some barriers, I could totally commit to this. Yeah. That's interesting. That's fascinating. So I, I feel more agnostic about this than good. I did coming in, which is, I mean, I guess that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, now, my last thought on this is before the pandemic, churches were already pretty committed to some online stuff anyway. Yeah, for sure. Streaming, recording, uh, and so this isn't new. It's just now kind of gotten um, metastasized. I don't yeah. know if that's the right word. Uh, just, you know, exploded. Pretty <laughs> um, cancerous. Solid. <laughs> it tells you where I'm at, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so this is fascinating. I, I mean, I think church leadership is really going to have to think hard about this. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you guys think? Are you going to continue on Zoom? Are you going to be a Zoom church person? Or are you going back to in person? What would a hybrid model look like that is satisfactory or healthy for you guys leave us a comment 
tune in. Maybe we'll keep talking about this. Go to church. <laughs> right? Go to church. Exactly. Make sure you tune in next time, and we'll see you guys soon on Kingdom Thinking.